Well, it is good to be with you all this morning. How many this weekend took advantage of what may have been, I'm not trying to speak or prophesy anything here, but what may have been the last nice weekend of the year as far as weather-wise? Worked in the lawns, anybody go on any runs or bike rides or anything like that? This side of this room is really uh, active, and you guys are just, must be lazy or something. I don't know what it, what it is, but... Uh, Man, I've, I've enjoyed the fall weather, and just like Pastor Jeff was saying, when I saw that it was supposed to be 35 degrees on Wednesday, I couldn't have been more thankful to uh, have the light the night indoors and not outdoors this year, because that can be pretty miserable. We are continuing in our series, Hearing God's Voice, and if you missed last week, um, it's very important that you go online and listen to either Pastor Jeff's message, which was in the morning, or you go uh, and listen to Pastor Zach's message that was in the evening service. Many of you don't know that the, our 6 p.m. service is a completely different service than our morning service. There's different worship. There's a different sermon. It's, it's a completely different service. And so we're in this four-part series of hearing God's voice. And we've already finished two of the points. Now we're on the third part of this series. And tonight, Pastor Brian's going to be wrapping it up talking about hearing God's voice and how it pertains to your calling in your life. As a pastor, probably the main question that I get asked at at all times, probably the number one question that I get asked is, Austin, how do I hear God's voice? How do I know if God is speaking to me? How can I recognize, I I, I feel like I can't hear God's voice. That is the the number one thing that people come to me and talk to me about. And, And so I don't think that if you're sitting here in this pew and you're sitting here today and you're like, man, I struggle or I relate to this, you're not alone. I think at all times in, in, or at, at different times in all of our lives, we have each struggled with hearing God's voice and deci- deciphering what he's speaking to us. And so this is important that if you missed last week, you need to go online and invest in yourself and your ability to hear in God's word. And you need to come back tonight too, because this is very, very important. You know, some people uh, think, oh, you know, Pastor Austin, uh, you've got this. You're a pastor. It's easy, but this morning I'm speaking from a place of vulnerability. Like, like I, I, uh, I struggle with each one of these things, and this morning we're going to be talking about roadblocks to hearing God's voice, potential roadblocks that prevent us from hearing God's voice. And um, what you need to remember this morning is that hearing God's voice is more affects more than just you and your family. You know, because I think a lot of times we have this, this idea where it's like, man, uh, I can't hear God's voice and I can't tell what God wants me to do next or where he wants me to go next. And, and we're so concerned with hearing God's voice in what it pertains to me, myself, and I. But what you need to realize this morning is that we want you to hear God's voice and you need to hear God's voice because it's so much bigger than just you and your family. Like, if, if Satan can derail me of hearing God's voice, who does that affect? As your pastor, as your leader. And each one of you are placed in different people's lives for a specific purpose and a specific mission, and we all carry this responsibility of hearing God's voice and responding, and if you cannot do that, and if you're failing to do that, you're not just failing yourself and your family, but you could be failing the world and the greater community around you. And so this morning, it is so important that we take a look at these potential roadblocks and then address it. At the end of the sermon, I'm going to ask for a response. And for some of you, the response might be the easiest thing that you guys have to do. And it's just a fairly simple response. But for others, your response might be the most difficult thing that, that you have done in your entire life. God might call you to something. God might speak something, impress something on your heart. And and at the end of this sermon, we're all going to, I believe that God is going to speak to us. We're all going to have something that we feel like, man, God is is nudging me in this direction, in this area of my life. And what I'm encouraging us is all to take a step towards action. To all take a step towards change through the power of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is going to speak to us. He's going to convict us. But he's not going to leave us to do that on our own. 
Our God is a faithful God, and so through the power and the strength of Jesus Christ, you can do what he's calling you to do. And, and, and I'll, just, I'll just say this. God might call someone to maybe sell their house and move into missions. And maybe he's been speaking that to you for a number of years. God will empower you to do that. Some of you have been ignoring things that God has been placing on your heart like, man, I really feel like I'm supposed to reconcile with my mom, even though I've done that a million times. Or I I need to reconcile with my brother or my sister, and I've forgiven them a thousand times, but I feel like I'm supposed to do it again. Listen, God will give you the strength to do that. And so whatever he calls you to at the end of this time of, of gathering, I want us all to take a step towards change because it would be foolish for us just to gather, hear something, have the word of God speak to us, feel that in our hearts, and then leave unchanged. Am I right? Before we uh, jump in uh, scripture today, which we're going to be bouncing around, I just want to pray. And so would you just join me in, in an attitude of prayer? God, I thank you for the opportunity to share this morning. I thank you that you've been speaking to me and I just pray this morning that even as I'm, I'm talking about uh, roadblocks and hearing your voice, God, that you would just begin to download information into my mind, that you would speak through me what you want to say this morning, that our eyes and our hearts would be open to that, they'd be receptive to that, and that we would set our eyes on Jesus Christ who enables us to do these things and, and not become so overwhelmed in the tasks that you have given us, Lord. So may we be encouraged, may we be challenged. And most importantly, by your power and by your strength, may we leave here changed. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. All right. The first roadblock to hearing God's voice might be a little bit of a repeat from last week's sermon, but it's simply ignorance, okay? Ignorance does not mean stupid. It means lack of knowledge. Now raise your hand if you didn't know that. I'm just teasing, okay? Okay, it means lack of knowledge. It means simply you did not know that. How do you know if God is speaking to you? You have to get familiar with the word of God. If you feel unsure of what God is speaking to you, then you go to what you know. In Psalm 119, verses 10 through 12, it says this, I seek you with all my heart. Do not uh, let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. The author, who is likely King David, writes how he seeks God is by hiding God's word in his heart. So you can seek God by praying and meditating, but if you are ignoring the written word of God, hear me, then you are ignoring the best way to become confident in hearing God's voice. The way we know that when God speaks to us and when he impresses something on our heart and we have that little gut check, we have that conscience, that Holy Spirit moment, the way we know whether or not it's God or not is we go back to the Bible and say, does this align with God's word? Does this, does this align with, does this make sense of, of, of who God is? Man, people have done absolutely horrible things, horrible things, because they thought that God was speaking to them. This past April, A man in Austin, Texas, killed his wife and his two daughters, and when he was apprehended, he told the police, I felt the Lord told me to do that. How sick and twisted and wrong is that? If he would have just had this biblical knowledge of of looking at the Bible and said, okay, I feel led to do this, does it align with God's word? He would understand in that moment and say, absolutely not. You, you know that everything that God is going to ask you to, be, to do in your life is, is laced in love, is, is, is just completely encompassed in love. It's not to hurt anyone. It's to restore people. And Now, I would like to believe that nobody here would do something as crazy as that, but if you're not familiar with the Word of God, then you're more susceptible to doing something that doesn't align with God's will. Now, let me give you a hypothetical example that might be a little bit less drastic than the man in Austin, Texas, but say you're praying and you feel like God lays on your heart that you've got a friend or a brother or a sister or someone that you knew that used to walk with the Lord, but they've kind of taken a step back in their faith and and they're just struggling and, and maybe they're doing something where they know it's wrong and you know that they know it's wrong because you've had conversations, you grew up together or whatever it is, and now you feel like God is 
laying on your heart to write a letter to this individual to challenge them. And so you write this letter, and in this letter, uh, you, you have all truth, uh, no grace, you're completely judgmental, you've got mean inflammatory statements like you should be ashamed of yourself or how could you ever, and you write this letter and, and, and what, what, what's the point? If you are familiar with God's word, you'd know in Galatians 6.1 that it says if a brother or sister is caught in a sin, you gently restore that person in love. And, and that's just one of many verses that talks about that. See, oftentimes you get the what you should do from God, but your biblical ig ignorance or illiteracy, just not understanding it, prevents you from carrying it out in a way that really is godly and really is the way that God would have you move forward in that. And God will never lead you to do something that is against the Bible. So get familiar with the Bible so that you can recognize God's voice. God doesn't always speak things that are logical. So we use the Bible as a resource so that we can walk in obedience with confidence. You know what else builds your confidence? Is that when, when you feel like the Lord speaks to you and then you align it with God's word, does this match up with what his word says or doesn't say? And then you act upon that? you'll start to see the fruit of that and you'll build confidence in it. So for me, this is what it looks like. I feel like led to call someone or to text someone or God drops it in my heart and says, this person was widowed a year ago or, or 18 months, they're just struggling, would you just call them? And you know, or, or I'm at the grocery store, talk to that person. Talk to them about meat or what type of cheese they're buying or whatever it is, you know, just, just talk to them. And I have this moment of obedience where I, either I can go with that feeling, I can go with that gut, I can kind of go where I feel like the Lord is leading me, or I cannot. But every time that I go with kind of where the Lord is, is, is leading me and I send that text or I make that phone call or I reach out and I talk to that stranger, oftentimes People just say, Pastor Austin, or stranger tall guy that's just really talking to me about cheese right now. You know, they say, you're a godsend. This is exactly what I needed in this moment. I was struggling so much. And what that does to me is it builds a confidence so that I can walk in confidence. I, I don't have to obey thinking, oh, I hope this is the right thing to do. I can see God's faithfulness in the small things in my life so that if he were to ask me to build a boat when it hasn't rained or if he were to ask me to deliver a nation across a Red Sea or whatever it would be, I can do that in confidence because I see his faithfulness in the small things. So every small opportunity that you have of hearing God's voice, if it aligns with God's word, is an opportunity for you to build your confidence in hearing God's voice and he'll start to speak things bigger and, and more bold to you. Ask yourself this morning, do you need to get more familiar with the word? Really, like are, are you trying to obey God out of a state of ignorance? The second potential roadblock is simply a lack of habit. Now Elizabeth was reading in her devotional this week and she sent me this text uh, with this quote from it, and, and in the devotional, it was a, a coach, and the coach was being interviewed, and what the coach said in this interview, he says, athletes under pressure, they don't rise to the occasion, they default to their training. Growing up, I, I played baseball, I played a lot of baseball, probably 80 or 90 games a summer, and, and, um, then in the off season, I would go to Grand Slam USA, which is like an indoor pitching tunnel. You know, you're, you're taking swings in the tunnels and everything. And one of the big buzzwords in the coaches that the coaches use was muscle memory. And I had one coach that said, it takes 10,000 repetitions of doing something correctly to create muscle memory. But how many know that science uh, proves that there's no such thing as muscle memory, right? Your, your muscles don't have, like, brains that... that that work for themselves. What you are doing in those repetitions and going after is you are creating a habit so that when the pressure comes, you default to your training. You default to what your training has told you. I, how many have been watching any baseball? Okay, uh, the ALCS was a little bit disappointing. I'm a Yankees fan. I'm a very big Yankees fan. So if anybody ever wants to bless me with a ticket to a Yankees game, feel free. Just throwing that out there. But you know, in, in, in games two and in games uh, six of the ALCS, Yankees versus the Astros, the Astros hitters 
hit two walk-off home runs against a guy that's throwing 102, 103 miles an hour. You don't see those guys under the pressure all of a sudden swinging you know, out of their form and stuff. They're under pressure. They're doing what their training told them. So I want to ask you this. What habits have you been forming in your life? How have you been conditioning yourself and training yourself to hearing the voice of God? Do you only listen to God when you need something, or are you listening to him in the mundane, in the daily, in just the the everyday routine? What habits have you set in your life? Some of you habitually reach for your phone every morning. Some of you turn on the radio first thing when you get in the car. When you get home from work, the first thing you do is you turn on the news and then you make your family dinner. We are constantly in the process of making habits. Have you made it a habit and a priority to set time aside just simply to hear God's voice? Some of you have habitually ignored a conviction placed on your heart by God. And you don't even realize it. God has been speaking to you about something and you know that there needs to be change. You know that there needs to be consistency. 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 Okay? You, you know that there's got to be action. And God has continued to speak, but you've continued to put that off. What you're doing is you're creating a habit of disobedience. You're callousing your heart to what God is speaking to you. In, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells a story about a master who entrusts his servants with different amounts of money and then leaves for a period of time and returns. And in verse 19, Jesus says this, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See that I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Now, I understand that Jesus was talking about physical things in this specific parable, but there is a principle in all stories that Jesus teaches. And the principle in this story, in this parable, is this. To whom God can entrust a little, God can entrust more. So ask yourself, what's more important than God giving you a word and entrusting you with a word and you've been now entrusted with it? If if you're just ignoring that, why would he speak more? Why would he ask you to do bigger and greater things? And you're over here seeking answers about what your next career change is going to be or who you're going to marry. And God is like, hold up, I've told you five different times to cut this pet sin out of your life and you're not obeying me. I want you to respond to this before I give you something new. You've created a habit of disobedience. In Matthew 7, verse 24, Jesus said to the one who listens to his words and puts them into practice, And puts them into practice, responding, obeying. It's like the man who built his house on the rock. And when the storms come and the winds come and it beats against the house, that house stands firm. But the man who listens to Jesus' words and does not put them into practice is like the foolish builder who built his house on sand. And when the winds come and the storm came, that house fell over. Take a moment to be honest in your heart. Have you created a habit of hearing God's voice but ignoring what God is speaking to you? I I don't think that anybody intentionally does that, right? But, But subliminally and just over time, you just become calloused to that. Are there things that you're ignoring from the Lord? Because if there are, they could be standing in the way as a roadblock as to what to do next. Maybe God is calling you to forgive someone. And and, and you're just like, I just, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. Maybe maybe God is is calling you to reconcile a a relationship. Maybe God is is calling you to, to grab hold of your finances and really buckle down and be a steward of what he's given you. Maybe God is telling you to do something in your parenting that you're not doing and and you maybe need to to have a 
a real conversation with your kid and you've been ignoring it because you're afraid that if you show any form of, of structure that your kid is going to run from you. What is it that God has been pressing on your heart and, and there's a lack of obedience? I'm telling you, that can be a roadblock to hearing God's voice and you will callous your heart and your mind to that. Do you seek God's voice only when things are difficult and when you need Him? Or are you habitually spending time every day trying to be still? You know how I do that? I've got three kids at home. And from the time that they wake up until the time they go to bed and then trying to do dishes and laundry and whatever else it is, you know, by the end of the day you're just kind of wiped, right? You know where I get my alone time? The time that I've set a habit of hearing God's voice? I commute from Grimes to Urbandale every single day. Should be about a 17-minute drive if I'm really pushing it. You know, it might be more like a 12-minute drive depending on lights. Sometimes in rush hour traffic, it ends up being about 25 minutes. You know, it just kind of depends. But I've just decided I'm not going to have the radio on. I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to say, Okay, God, what is it that you want to speak to me? And sometimes he doesn't speak much. Sometimes it's just kind of a mindless, decompressing ride home, you know, and I just kind of just ease out of my day. But oftentimes he'll just remind me of someone or a conversation that I had with someone that said, ends in, hey, I'll I'll be praying for you. And he's like, you know what? You need to check in on that person. So what do I do? As I'm driving, I pull up my phone and I go, hey, Siri, call dad. Calling dad. Mobile. And I make a phone call, just as simple as that, on my way home. And you know what I was talking about earlier on the last point as far as building confidence? I promise if you start to to go with that, you start to go with your instinct when the Holy Spirit just kind of pushes that on your heart, you'll start to build a confidence and he'll start to speak bigger and bolder things in your life. Are you making it a habit? The third potential roadblock is your lifestyle. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, and as you turn there, I want to tell you a little bit about my obsessive tendencies in life. Maybe make you feel a little bit better. Elizabeth and I are going to take a vacation next month, and this will be the first vacation that we have taken uh, that either, one, she wasn't pregnant, two, nursing a child, or three, just with kids. And so, like, this is our, like, we've, we've done overnight trips or things like that, you know, one, one night, but this is like a vacation that is meant for us. So, so to say that I am elated and super excited is like an understatement. Like we get to sleep past seven o'clock without, dad, dad, I've got to go potty. You can do that, buddy. You don't need permission, you know. So I am, I'm stoked about this vacation. But what's been happening over the last couple of months as we've been planning and preparing for this is I start looking to all the different places that we're planning on going and visiting, and I'm like, ooh, what can we do here? And what's the best way to do this? And what restaurants should we check out? And what does TripAdvisor have to say about this city and this town? And, and we plan, and we plan all about this luxury of a vacation, and what happens is I'm spending so much time focusing on the future of something that really is kind of trivial in life that I'm not present in the now. How much time do you spend thinking about tomorrow and not today. Last month, Pastor Kerry's got me all jacked up about these shared interest groups, and uh, I I don't know about you guys, but it's a wonderful idea. In fact, um, yesterday I just got to kind of put that into practice, but I I love uh, mountain biking, okay? Um, Sometimes I still think I'm a little bit like a 12-year-old because I just don't know when not to send it, and uh, (laughs) I get, get myself in trouble. But I love mountain biking, and so Pastor Kerry's got me jacked up, and, and I was like, you know what, if I'm going to do a shared interest group of mountain biking where I get together with my friends and, and you know, just intentionally have conversations about God and, and enjoy the outdoors and stuff, I'm, I want to upgrade my bike. How many of you are like me, when you want to buy something, you research it for like, like just tons and tons of research. Like you want to get bang for your buck, like find your budget, and then like I want the nicest that I can just do. I feel like, oh, there's a whole bunch of guys not being truthful in it. It's like, hey, I'm going to look at this motorcycle because, uh, you know, motorcycles are sweet. And your wife's like, you don't even have a motorcycle's license. Yeah, I'm still going to look at it, you know. I mean, just, just kind of in that. 
And, and I found myself spending all this time on Facebook Market and in these bike groups on Facebook or Craigslist or pinkbike.com, which sells a whole bunch of used bikes. And, and I was just like obsessing over this and it was taking away from my ability to hear God's voice because I was consumed with something else. I'm being real with you this morning. Like the lifestyle that I choose to live can distract me from not being in tune with God's voice. The lifestyle that I choose to live. This is an area that I feel like I constantly have to be aware about. And if I'm not careful, my possessions begin to possess me. Matthew chapter 6 is a very comforting portion of Scripture, and starting in verse 25, it says, Therefore, now anytime you see a therefore in Scripture, what are you supposed to do? Stop and see what it's there for. So let's back up to verse 19 and see what this therefore is for. That was a lot of therefores and fours and fours and theirs. Jesus said this in verse 19, Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moss and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jump to verse 24. No one, no one can serve two masters. This is Jesus speaking. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now in verse 25. Therefore... I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than the birds in the sky? Can any one of you add a single hour of life by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. Solomon was the richest and wisest man that has ever been on the face of the planet, uh, the Bible says. Verse 30. If that is how God clothes the grass on the field, which is here today and then thrown into the fire, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now I want to ask you a question in in reading this passage of Scripture. Why would Jesus bring up worry immediately after talking about not storing up treasures on earth? Do you see the correlation? See, the more you have, the more you have to be responsible for. The more it demands of your attention and begs of your attention. Now, I'm not preaching against having things, right? Like, if if you've got a boat and you've got a lake house or you've got whatever, I'm not... I'm not saying that you can't have those things or that it's it's bad. But if those things possess you and you don't possess them, then that's where it becomes a problem. My dad growing up all the time told me, Austin, love people and use things. And don't mix the two up. Don't use people and love things. Ask yourself, with all of the things that you have, with all of the things that you choose that you need, even though we don't really need them. I don't really need a smartphone. Of all the things that, that, that we have, is it distracting you from God and His voice? Do you use the things that you have to bless other people? Do, do you, do you the, the things that you have, are you using it to influence people into the kingdom of God? Some of you guys have a beautiful home. Dude, I'm, I'm speaking in two weeks about inviting people to the table. We're going to start a new series. 
I'm telling you, like, you got to start using your home for what it was intended for, which is having meals and bringing people in and, and doing that. Use what you have to influence people. Ask yourself this. Do you spend more time thinking about the things that you own rather than the God who owns you? You have been purchased. You are bought and redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and saved from your penalty of sin, which is hell and eternal separation from God. I think that demands a pretty good amount of our time and our thoughts thinking about what God wants. And I, like I said, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be um, judgmental. I don't want you to think, well, here's a pastor being manipulative and making me feel guilty because I drive a BMW or whatever or a Porsche or whatever. And it's like, I'm, this, is not, this, is, this is nothing to do it. What I'm asking you to do is to join me in my effort to live a life free of roadblocks where we don't become so consumed. Some people live so paycheck to paycheck because they just can't live without that the daily grind, hear me, the daily grind speaks louder than the voice of the Lord. Maybe God is calling you to downsize. Might give you more time to think about him and what he wants rather than just affording your, your house. Maybe God is, is speaking to you about your credit card use or about needing a new car every other year or whatever it is. Join me in an effort to live with less so that we can be less distracted. We can be less divided. Is this a roadblock, the lifestyle? Is it a roadblock in your life? Are you willing to respond to God this morning? Ignorance, habits, lifestyle and the last roadblock that I'm going to talk about is being oversaturated with other voices. Podcasts, mentors, sermons, devotionals, self-help books, Christian literature, pastors, TED Talks, you name it. We spend a lot of time listening to what other people have to say. And depending on the author or depending on the teacher, depending on the person and the voice that you're listening to, there's definitely value in that. But ask yourself this, are other people's voices louder than the voice of God? Who is the most influential person in your life? Right now, who has the most influence and impact on your life? You know what I cringe? Anytime that someone says, oh man, man, Pastor Austin, you've had such an impact on me. And I know they're trying to be but they say, I, you know, I, I, just, I just don't know without you, you know, I don't think I can make it without you. It's not about me, it's about Jesus Christ. I, I, don't, want, I don't want people to, to, to necessarily like just fully lean on me, because I'm going to fail you. I'm, I'm working the same thing out that you guys are working out. Jesus Christ has to be the number one influence in your life. Some of you guys like have five or six or 12 different friends or people that you really respect that you go to for advice and guess what happens? All of them give you different advice because they don't really know what you really need. Some of you go to a book for your parenting advice. Some of you go to YouTube, how to talk to my child about whatever. What voices are you allowing in your life? One direct word from the Holy Spirit of God will take you so much farther than some regurgitated word that I can give you. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 25 says, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The Lord said through the prophet Elijah that God's ways and thoughts are higher than ours. 
if God's foolishness is wiser than any man's wisdom, then why do we tend to run to man before God? I remember a time when I was just really at a, a crossing point in my life and trying to figure out, like, and what's next? Where am I supposed to go? You know, I was just really trying to seek out the will of God. And I went first to my dad because I respect him and I believe and trust in his ability to hear from the Lord. I've seen him be used in that way. And then I went to Pastor Jeff and I went to different people. And, and I was looking in all the wrong places for God's voice. And what I appreciated about them is they all said, you know, Austin, we can sit down here and think the pros and cons and weigh out things. This makes a lot of sense. This doesn't make a lot of sense. And I can help you make a logical decision, but really only the Lord knows exactly where you're supposed to go and what you're supposed to do. What voices are in your life right now? And whose voice is the loudest? Some of you are oversaturated. Too many voices, too many opinions. Are you willing to wait on the Lord and hear what he wants to speak to you? Or do you just want the quick fix where I can read a 200-page book on parenting and have it all down? Man, God has something special for you. For each and every single one of you. We're going to close this morning. And at the beginning, if you remember, I said that I was going to ask for everybody to respond in some way. And for some of you, it might be fairly easy. You just might need to delete something on your phone or just whatever it is. Others of you, it might be the most difficult thing that you have ever done in your life. But I want to remind you that we serve a faithful God who empowers us and equips us to carry out exactly what he's calling us to. So in just a moment, I'm going to pray. And when I pray, I'm calling you to, to a posture of response. Because for different people, people like can hear God differently and, and just at, in, in different like response. So there's some people who are really old where they worked a hard life, earned a fair living, and their knees and their feet, they just hurt all the time. Their back hurts. And so if I were to call you all to stand this morning, there'd be some people because of physical pain that would have a really difficult time hearing the voice of the Lord because of that physical pain. There's other of you that are a lot like me where it's a little bit warm, you know, almost got the sweat on, not quite. And you're sitting in your pew and if you just stay seated in your pew and you close your eyes and you try to listen to God, it ends up being just a nice little head bob, you know, type of moment. Others of you, you might just need to, in your posture of, of uh, response, stand up or, or simply maybe come down to the altar. The altar is nothing magical, nothing special about it. It's just, it's just an area of surrender, of sacrifice, of saying, God, it's not about me. It's not my will, but it's your will. I'm, I'm here. I'm open. I want to hear you. And, and that's your posture. You need to come down here, stand or kneel, or, or you don't want to fall asleep. So you just stand up where you're at. But we're all going to move in a, a posture of response, and it'll look differently across this place. Throughout this whole sermon, I believe that God has been speaking and nudging on your heart different roadblocks, different things. Listen, if you've been impressed in your heart in one of these areas, you can bet your bottom dollar that that is the Lord speaking to you. And now, just you're in the same boat that I'm in, because there's been things that God has been speaking to me about the roadblocks, and there's, there's, I've got a lot of them. And, and now we're in the same situation where God is impressing something, leading us to something, speaking, nudging, just kind of that feeling. And now we have the opportunity to either respond, take a step towards change, 
take a step towards what God is calling us to be and who, who we're supposed to be, or we can run from that. So as I pray, I want you to find that posture of response. And then after I pray, we're just going to spend two minutes just sitting and just asking God, what would you speak to me this morning? So Jesus, as those come, they stand, whatever they're getting in their posture of response right now, God, I pray that you'd begin to speak that you'd begin to just slowly nudge in our hearts that we would know that we would have clarity. God, for those that are feeling restless, I just pray that they would just slow down and be in your presence and have an assurance of what you're leading them to, God. I pray that you'd begin to reveal different roadblocks, continue to reveal them in my life, to everyone here. And God, I pray against the spirit of pride or fear and we would set our eyes on you as you've called us to do whatever you're calling us and asking us to do. So this morning, would you just speak to us, speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, let's take the next two minutes. We're just going to ask God to speak to us. your eyes closed and your head bowed out of the respect of those sitting next to you. I just want to give the opportunity for anyone who feels like maybe the Lord is saying, hey, come home. You're not right with me. You've been running and it's a time of repentance. This is not to be a moment of shame or guilt, but this is a moment of redemption and reconciliation of a loving father. Or maybe for the first time in your life, you'd say, Jesus, would you come into my life? Would you save me of my sin? I believe that you died on a cross and three days later, you rose, you defeated death and hell, and the grave, and now you're waiting in heaven for me and preparing a place for me. And you're saying, Austin, I need the strength in Jesus Christ. I need the forgiveness of sins or Austin, I just really feel like, man, I just need to take some steps back to the, towards the Lord. I've been living in rebellion. If that's you, just with every eye closed, would you just simply just raise your hand? I just want to pray for you this morning. Is there anyone here? Yeah? No? Is there anyone else? Jesus, I pray for those that raise their hand wherever they're at, God, I pray that they would lean into you, that they would take a step closer to you and they would experience the forgiveness, the strong, forgiving, loving arms of you, God. I pray that their eyes would not be on their past, 
but it'd be on the future that you have prepared for them. You'd save them, forgive them, wash them white as snow. Help them believe, God. Remove the stain of guilt and shame that they would walk forward in freedom and confidence knowing that you've saved them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.